to lend some of my celebrity to these folks today for this fine podcasting panel. We have four fantastic podcasters from the Hysteria 51 podcast, always broadcasting from the lower fourth dimension of Chicago. I have John Goforth, who believes in nothing, Brent Ann, who believes in everything, and these guys, including love, right, Lisa? Along with their murderous but loving robot, do a podcast every week where they talk about all kinds of fringe subjects and paranormal things, and, and I'll let them talk about that in just a little bit. We also have Jason Kupsik, who we wouldn't even be here but for uh, what he and Hector have done, so we really appreciate that. Jason, uh, I can tell you that... Uh, Dicks and Mosquitoes love this guy. Oh, yeah, that's true. Um, so, and, and then uh, we also have uh, Josh Hurd. Yeah. See, Josh has been spending his life lying awake in bed at night, hoping that the aliens will not come tonight to abduct him. That's right. That's now, right. there's cameras all around the place, and tonight may be the night. I hope not. I mean, <laughs> we've been waiting for the bad news, Josh. Big day. Now, today's not the day that Josh is well, maybe tonight. But uh, did Josh, who did, uh, what, what we decided was the Looking at the Bright Lights movie, or what was the... <laughs> okay. Josh, the award-winning, award-winning documentary filmmaker, makes Into the Light, we're looking at Into the Light 2 coming up uh, later this year. Yes. Yeah, okay. So, these guys do the Ectoplasm Show, where they look at all things paranormal, Look at paranormal news each week. Sometimes they do some uh, topics. Uh, so I'm here to moderate this panel about podcasting and the paranormal and all things paranormal. So to kind of kick it off a little bit, and then we'll toss it to you guys so you can ask them questions and pick their brains about what it is they do. Every good comic book hero has a fantastic origin story. So I know all of you guys. I don't really know how you got to where you are as far as the paranormal aspect of what you do comes from. So starting at this end, Jason, tell us just a little bit about whatever it is that I said that was wrong about you. But, and also, just a little bit of background. How did you get into paranormal researching and investigation and then, and then the, the media, the, the podcasting, putting out your show? Okay, so I, the very first paranormal thing I ever had happen was the UFO. When I was seven, it was just a point of light in the sky. Um, I look at it now, and I still don't know an explanation for it, so what was that? But, yeah, it probably it was. Um, but, yeah, so since then, I just read books and stuff about paranormal for a long time, and, and we decided we wanted to go with sports and stuff a few years ago. As far as podcasting, uh, the Ectoplasm Show was, was failing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Josh started the Ectoplasm Show because another friend of his pushed him into it. He didn't want to do it. He didn't want to do it. And then the other guy bailed after a dozen episodes and left Josh sitting there talking to himself. I had to take a break from the paranormal for about a year and a half. And I was coming back into it at the same time, so I rode in on my white horse. They don't call him Dr. Parapsychology, 
So, I mean, up until this point now, I guess I've done nine documentary films, uh, six books on the subject of the paranormal. Um, while I was in college, I was also a broadcasting major. Um, so, late night radio at the, you know, the college station and things of that nature. Um, I always thought it was a lot of fun. Um, I will say that if you're looking, you know, to do radio, um, it's not exactly something that you can do that well with the family. Uh, there's a lot of moving around and things of that nature uh, in the radio biz. Um, but podcasting seems to be perfect because I could just turn on the computer, um, turn on the, the soundboard, and just go. You know? Does everyone in the room know what a podcast is? I guess we need to back up a little bit because these guys are podcasters. Anybody here, not to embarrass you, doesn't know what a podcast is in this day and age? Okay. A podcast is essentially Netflix for the radio. It's on demand. Just about everybody's phone has an app on it nowadays that you can type in any subject that you can imagine, and there's going to be someone who has an interest in that subject that gets on a microphone and starts telling stories or doing interviews. We're talking about that subject. It's a very, very popular thing. I think the last count there was, John, what, 550,000 podcasts out there right now? Yeah, uh, and... About 26% of the entire country listens to podcasts on a monthly basis, which is about 73 million people. Right. And this is generally free on-demand content, so there is just lots and lots of information out there. But it's real, It's very, very easily accessible to anybody. If you have a story to tell or something you're interested in, you can pick up your phone and you can start recording in it. You can publish it as a, as a podcast. So, But these guys take that to the next level, and they have uh, well-researched shows, high production value, well it's not. So, so anyway, sorry to interrupt there, but I know we do keep talking about podcasting, and uh, it's kind of, it's still a relatively new thing about the last 15 years or so that people have really been doing podcasting. But the, the paranormal, uh, things like like the, the ghost hunting or uh, the Sasquatch, things like that, I mean, it lends itself perfectly to podcasting because you can focus it on these like-minded people, and if there's something you're interested in, you can go find those groups of people now, whereas 25 years ago, it was really, really hard to find those people. You're who are people right, right. Yeah. You're just that guy. Yeah. That's a sport. Yeah. Right. So, carry on. No, that was, I mean, and then I was approached by my friend Myron, who was telling me about this podcast thing, and he wanted to basically come in as a skeptic, uh, and then, you know, talk about paranormal stuff and basically call me crazy as much as possible. Um, and I think, yeah, he only lasted just not even two dozen episodes probably and then in rides Kubzik on his white horse. Um, say, and now it's just two crazy people. Now not, it's just, a, yeah. not a believer in a skeptic. Right, right. Which brings us to next level podcasting. Hysteria 51. <laughs> so Hysteria 51, uh, it, it, if you're not familiar with our show, uh, we talk about everything unusual, UFOs, the mysterious, the unexplained, the, the supernatural, the paranormal, uh, but we try to do it through a kind of every man's eye, and uh, there's there's three hosts. Uh, there's myself, this guy right next to me, Brent Hand, and then our third host is an angry robot named Conspiracy Bot, who's bent on uh, on taking over the world. And... Uh, so obviously we, we, we try to add a little levity to the show, but we, we do take our research seriously, and uh, and, and we try to we try to put as much as we can into every episode. The uh, the, the way we got started, um, and I'll let Brent tell tell the majority of this story. But we, we started talking. About, we went to college together. We actually grew up together. We've known each other for almost uh, thirty years now, <laughs> way too long. And uh, and we we started in college talking about doing a radio show together and. Uh, and then we, we waited a handful of years till we actually decided to do a podcast together. Um, the uh, as far as how I got into it, um, I, I I wasn't into the paranormal or UFOs. I was always into the unusual. I think would be the best way to say it. Uh, time travel always interested me. You know, the idea of simulation theory I thought was kind of cool. That kind of stuff. You know, uh, interesting puzzles from history. Uh, I mean, history. History Channel like never leaves my uh, my TV. Um, so that that kind of stuff always interested me. And then and Brent's much more on the on the 
paranormal side of things, and we're both interested in UFOs. And uh, and so that's how kind of the, the show came together. But I'll let, I'll let Brent take it from there. I was a weird kid who lived in a haunted house. So everyone's like, oh, my God, you know, look like it. So I did invade him with stories growing up. And uh, my dad and I always loved watching you know, anything we could and talking aliens and stuff like that. So John has had his entire life in radio up until, uh, you know, a handful of years ago when he got in, he switched from radio. We did a podcast, and like he said, we'd always talked about doing a show together. And we said, well, we could very much do this with a podcast. And we wanted to f- figure out what we were going to do, and I pushed for this because this is finally I have my, you know, my my wife has to hear me talk about this crap nonstop. Might as well like subject other people to it. And he was perfect because I was more of the believer; he is more the skeptic. But we both looked at everything kind of with, you know, uh, inquisitive every man eyes. Yeah, you know, and uh, we dive into the topics, and uh, we are actually getting ready to celebrate our second anniversary, and we're a hundred episodes in, and. Having a blast doing it. The tagline for our show is, uh, the truth is out there, but you won't find it here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys had a couple of shows before. Scenario, right? we, did, uh, we did a show called Rather Fan for a while, and uh, we had another show that kind of was only on for a little bit. But this was the, uh, we were trying to, oh, let's do a couple podcasts. And then this one took off, and then it became, uh, I, you know, John's like, well, we're not going to do two because I don't have time. And then it became that now this is my full time job. This is all I do. And I no longer have, you know, I quit and, and uh, <laughs> work from home now doing this. So we realized very quickly that a free podcast uh, isn't so free and uh, takes up a lot of time. And we went off when we got into podcasting. Uh, Ectoplasm Show was one of the first shows that we really reached out to. And it was the first show I ever. Guess, uh, guess those stood on with you guys. Same. That was our uh, guess. Uh, what was that? That was probably over two years ago or so. Yeah. Close. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, small world. Well, having heard that and kind of seeing what these guys are in, does anybody have any questions for any of these guys? Uh, back here, you believe? What do you have? Weird guy growing up in the haunted house. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's him. So I, I grew up in a small town. Uh, I'm from central Illinois. Uh, there's a town of 700 people. I'm, I grew up on a farm outside of it. Uh, we grew up on a mine, the edge of our uh, property, uh, about an acre from our house, is a uh, cemetery. It went back to the uh, late 1700s. And uh, we just we grew up in a house that had weird things that went on that you realized growing up you didn't talk about until I was a little bit older. You start talking to your mom and dad, and everyone's having these these things going on, and, and I grew up in a very Christian home. We didn't believe in those things. You didn't talk about those things, and all of a sudden, we were thrust into that, and we had to talk about it. And, and uh, so I always knew, growing up, that there was more out there, you know, at least in my experience, than than what you know they say. We would have um, uh, we had a basement, we had a wood burner, and you'd hear voices, and the door to the wood burner would would slam in the middle of the night, and you go down there, and there's no one there, or our garage door would open and close, and everything would be explained, you know, uh, or not, you know, and that's the things that grown up, you're just, you know, you either are going to live there terrified, or you're going to become interested in it and try to research it and figure it out, and then that's you know, 40 years in, <laughs> you know, and then still do it. So, so throughout the, the last 40 years of having lived that life and experienced those things, do you feel like that you have been able to, to have any sort of closure with those questions? I know nothing. No, you know, <laughs> I know nothing. More questions? Uh, I probably have more questions than ever. And you know what? The older I get, the more skeptical I get about everything else. And that's terrible. I look at everyone else and I'm like, you're full of crap, but I'm telling the truth. You know what I mean? Like, that's terrible. Because we sp- I spend my, that's not true, but I spend my life, my weeks, researching stories all the time. We research we write outlines week after week for stuff. John does the same thing, and it's just, you know, you become inundated, and it becomes your life. And then, you know, people go, hey, what's going on? I'm like, oh, let me tell you about this alien in <laughs> Nebraska or something, or this, this ghost. And, uh, you know, I know John, your wife, is, uh, this is out of her wheelhouse completely, and, and, and she gets... Well, I think the the one thing that you can say, no matter if you, uh, how skeptical or how much of a believer in anything that you are, is that a lot of the stories that you read and that you see are definitely generated by people just trying to make money, right? There's a lot of that out there, um, and and the 
the hard part is finding the signal in the noise. You know, uh, and 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 so so even if you even if you um, you know, no matter what subject we're talking about, are a believer in it, you know that a certain percentage of the stuff you read is just fabricated. It's just made up so somebody could could put together a website, so somebody could be on a show, so somebody could do something. And so the really hard part, and that's I think Brent, what you were talking about that that makes it so tough. And I'd love to hear what how you guys approach it, but it's it's trying to find that signal in the noise, to trying to understand, uh, look, this one is just, it's just somebody sitting behind a computer versus somebody who's actually experienced something. Yeah, the, the thing that, and I'll talk to you guys about this, but the, same, the thing that John always uses, like our sounding posts, is whether we believe something or we look at a story and we believe them, the thing is we always say, no matter what, I feel this person believes what they're saying. Right. You know, like, that's my big thing is when you look at somebody and you go, I, no matter how outlandish or not outlandish what you're saying, when you can tell someone believes what they're saying, I'm hooked. Absolutely. I think those crazy stories that you talked about, those are the ones we read first. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. It's pretty interesting stuff, honestly. But yeah, a lot of it is it's, it's tough to fill the swamp. We put yeah. fun at a lot of it. Just we do. That's part of our show. Right. But we don't do it maliciously. No. Um, but it's hard. It's like he says it all the time, and it's true. You kind of have to be there and experience these things for yourself to be a true believer in what you see. That's it's, what I was you trying to believe say someone's yeah. story because you trust them as a person. But if you don't see it, it's hard to believe that. To be honest, right? Yeah, I always say the paranormal is kind of like a uh, like a location joke. Um, when you walk up on like two friends who are just laughing their asses off at something that's apparently hilarious. And you're like, what's so funny? And they're like, oh, you just had to be there. Well, that's the exact same thing with paranormal stuff. You know, you just got to be there. Who else has a question out here? Sir? Since we share a little bit of problem with the uh, background thing, I, my first eight years of my life, I spent in Jewish cemetery on the Blue Ridge. Uh, do you think that gives you a little bit different insight for most people? Um. Well, you know, you growing up next to death is something that most people are uncomfortable with. To where, when you're a child and you're around that, as you know, then it just becomes okay. Well, this is part of life. And I mean, hell, when I was old enough to be walking, I would walk through the cemetery and try to read all the older you know, headstones that were old and things like that. And you're making up stories for the, the the people and doing all this stuff because that's just your life, you know. And I, I have a sister who's like nine years older than me. And, she tried her damnedest to scare the hell out of me all the time, you know, and that just becomes... So, yeah, I think I think it beats your fascination at that age, but it also just becomes, well, this is just, yeah, it's not that weird, where other people would look at that and go, hell no, you know, I don't want anything to do with that. Like, when women look at John, you know, they go, no. no. <laughs> and I think that's the best way to... <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so, so on the, along those lines, and, and the types of things that you grew up with, and whether it makes you more receptive or not, Jason, you saw the lights spin around in the sky as a child. Most of what you do now, aside from your show, involves uh, investigating locations and things. But have you seen the I, that that seems to be a divergence from from your origin story? Well, it is. So the first few paranormal experiences I had where I was 20 were UFO experiences. Um, but since then, before I started investigating, I had a ton of ghostly experiences as well. Though it is to form a team of people to go out and investigate something, and especially in the environment of pop culture even at that time, just not even pop culture, but the environment of the paranormal field at that time from 
flip flopped. Like your first was alien, and then you went into parent, you know, ghostly, whereas mine was the you know, hauntings. And then John and I have gotten into more aliens and conspiracies have become our bread and butter. You know, and it's just. Uh, but I have conspiracies all peppered in there. Like I was, course, it, it's like yeah. one of, like in the '90s, early days of the internet. I was just diving into all the conspiracy stuff, and, and I loved reading about that stuff. And there's, you know, different shades of people in this field. There's the type of people that love researching and reading, and, and take everything with a grain of salt. And then there are people out there that believe every little tiny thing. You got to find a, a medium in there. It can't be everything. Is possibility that everything will come but most likely it's a shade of Do you each feel like you have, I mean I guess, guess you've already said as you got well, gotten older you become more skeptical of other people, but you believe what you believe is right, something to that effect. Do you guys feel like you've become more open and receptive as you've gotten older and spending older more, or do you feel like you've become more contracted and you, you believe less than you believe in. Um, I've gone back and forth in that. I've, uh, at times I've found myself questioning things more skeptically. I think you have to have a skeptic mind when you look at everything. Um, though I try to, so these days, in the last few years, I've, I feel like I've molded myself into a viewpoint that I really like, where I go into an investigation, for example, of a haunted location the mindset that anything in there is possible, that I'm not looking for one, that little girl that might be lying in the place. I might look for that because there's a story there, but I try to open my mind up to all possibilities when I'm looking at whatever. Yeah, I, I used to tell clients that if I find a, a recording of something that says, hi, I'm Bob and I'm dead, whatever, and their grandfather was Bob and House. I'll look them in the eye and say, you know, this this could be your granddad grandfather, but I can't prove that. I don't know. It could be something insane. That's kind of how I have to view it, all of it, or I would get trapped into one mode and completely pushing out everything else that I can't prove. So I feel that widening the focus is so much better than. says, hey, JFK was assassinated, they go, 
we get weekly emails, that's completely wrong, you should kill yourself. Like, and that is the craziness that you deal with when you deal, you know, it's like, you're completely wrong, and I hate you, and blah, blah, and, and so it's, you got to, you got to weed through a lot of that, because we, unfortunately, we did a couple episodes on the flat earth, and we had, quote, unquote, flat earth experts on, and we gave them, so we had John and I, which obviously are, you know, as smart as they come, and then we had uh, a worker from NASA, a worker from SpaceX, a, a PhD in astrophysics, and two flat earthers, and we gave them, we called it the Flat Earth Roundtable. But they have YouTube channels, so... Yep. Yeah, they, they have YouTube channels, and so they, they're experts. And we sat out and let these people talk about all this, and we got death threats because we said that the Earth was round. And it blew my mind, and that was, that's probably been over a year ago, and it really, it really took me back to realize how vested people get into some of these things. And it also, you know, John and I were, were watching YouTube videos, we're reading, you know, bulletins, and we're reading newspapers, and we always say, we're going to give you the best that we can do to where these people are, can look a, a NASA, you know, worker and a PhD person and go, you're, you're an idiot and a liar. And everything you learned, you're, you're a plant and a shell. And that's that's just an example of, like, some of the, you've got to, don't be those people. <laughs> You'll find your find your balance. You know what I mean? Because, and I think you are just saying that, like, like, like uh, Jason was saying. about the flat earthers that give you death threats where you can't convince them otherwise. They are the same as the people that won't even open up the flat earth. There's a huge, exactly. there's a big difference. Right, um, just completely shutting down whatever you don't necessarily believe, without even having an open mind of another possibility. Because those people that believe that Earth is absolutely flat, there's nothing that they haven't seen it, just like nobody else has seen it right. around, except for the astronauts that have been in space. But so allegedly, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, but so they're they're being just they're being just the same as the people that they hate. Right. To, to give you an idea of the scope of these podcasts that you're putting out. This isn't something that they're broadcasting to eight or ten or a hundred or five hundred of their friends. Because of the accessibility of a podcast and the nature of these shows, hundreds of thousands of, of downloads each month happen for these shows. So lots and lots and lots of people will listen to some of these shows. And by virtue of that, you're getting all manner of these people, the people who are in the middle who are interested in passively interested in some of this stuff, but then you do get these way outside, wackadoo, all the way I believe in everything, and all the way you're completely crazy with nothing. You know, uh, and, and to, to talk about that open mind thing, uh, John, you, you've gone into the hotel that's um, supposed to be haunted, looking for ghosts, and found nothing. Josh, you've gone to the hotel, found the ghost, and bought the place. I mean, so so Sorry. when you have this this range of stuff here, how do you how do you enter into these situations and maintain that open mind in spite of the stuff that you've looked at? You know your your own preconceived notions. How do you, how do you manage that? That's the age old question for anything, right? I mean, what's more diverse and head but not head but but what you can mirror this through any other topic, such as religion or politics or anything. It's all extremes against the extremes and you have everybody in the middle that believe something or don't believe something but are kind of caught in the crossfire in their opinions. So it's the same with the federal. Well, well, and, and, and with all of those subjects, that crossfire, the loudest people are the ones who believe the farthest extremes. So the people who are going to be in the moderation, they, they've got a pick from those yelling from the rooftops. Who else has a question out here for these guys? Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> no, you guys stop talking conspiracies. I'm just kind of curious what you guys are favorite. If you have a specific conspiracy theory to have your favorite, that's what's up. Mike's JFK, hands down. Yeah, that's I've JFK, that's for sure. That's mine, too. I have nothing else to add. Yeah, I can talk for months. This is a paranormal panel. <laughs> Uh, 
want to talk to York, and we we did I did a lot of research for that, and it, it was on our radar because of I don't know if you guys have any of you watched Stranger Things on on uh, Netflix, but it is that is what it's based on, and it is, what what uh, it's on Montauk. Yeah, it's based on Montauk, and the story of Montauk is so much crazier than that. Like they toned it down. Then the, wow. Yeah, I mean, it involves a chair that makes anything you can imagine come true, an electric Sasquatch, time travel, uh, robbing of children and, and torturing them until their X gene, same as, uh, you know, magnifies and turning them into Manchurian candidates and stuff. And it just blew my mind. And there's these people that were, quote unquote, the, the uh, survivors and for a nominal fee. You can go to their website, and they'll tell you all about it, you know? And and these people are just banking off these stories. and and But then you find the people that really dug into it, that they go there to um, uh, debunk it, and there really was an underground base, and there's all these things. You're like, well, damn it, I don't feel like, well, how much of this could be true? But, you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm crossing my fingers for electric Sasquatch, whatever that is. Um, if, that, if not, it needs to be a band. At least, so yeah. <laughs> the other really intriguing, I, I don't know if it's a conspiracy, but um, I mean, it, it's in that realm because we keep we keep running into it. We we never sought out to to pursue this topic, but um, when you look at the paranormal, the occult, uh, UFOs, and all of it, uh, there's there's one group of people that keep popping up: the Nazis. Uh, they, uh, Hitler was really into that crazy, that crazy, crazy stuff. And, and I mean, actually, thank God he was, because they, I mean, a lot of historians say he spent so much time and money pursuing that kind of stuff. Like, so hey, let's, let's go. Let's he go. had a very open mind. Yeah. Uh, that's one way to put it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, instead of instead of fighting on the Western Front, let's send a bunch of people down to Antarctica and claim it for uh, so for, for Germany. The opening is there, right. <laughs> and so, but but every topic we look into, it's like there they are. Oh, Hitler was pursuing the spear of destiny. Oh, they they pursued time travel. Oh, it's just over and over and over again. And um, and while it, it, everything that he was after, he was just trying. He thought that he believed in everything. He just believed in all of it, and he went after it, and it's actually good for those of us that, that oppose that, because he used all of his resources doing that, and it and they actually say it helped uh, everybody win the war. But if you're writing your own conspiracy, the ones, even the, the craziest ones, pop, comes the Nazis, you're like, how do they think? The same formula we see over and over and over again, and so when you see the same thing, you're like, I don't know. So I would like you to answer how the Nazis are involved in my favorite conspiracy, that the state of North Dakota does not exist. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of people out there. Have you ever been to North Dakota? North Dakota? North Dakota? North Dakota? It's, it's sunk into the hollow earth. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're in Australia, because we know the oh, that's 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 flat that's earth, so there is no such thing as Australia. Who else has a question? No more for you, David. No, go ahead, what do you got? I'm just going to go off of spill on the next conspiracy subject. Uh, one of my favorites is the death of Elisa Lamb. Oh, we had a blast with it. And I'm just kind of curious to see where. Do you all know who Elisa Lamb was? So, Elisa Lamb was a, uh, a young Asian girl who was in um, California, and she died, I believe it was in 2011, and she. What happened was she went missing. They didn't know where her, she was. And then all of a sudden, the hotel she'd been staying in started having low water pressure and bad taste in the water. They went up and they found her body in the water tank. But the weird thing was it looked as though she had gotten in the water tank on her own. Her clothes were all folded deeply and sat there. So they go to the security tape, and she's in the elevator acting talking to someone who's not there and she's doing these weird movements and hitting buttons. It's very bizarre. And then you look into the whole, the, the what's the name of the, the hotel? Oh, the, uh, uh, hotel Cecil. Hotel Cecil. Uh, it was the home of Aleister Crowley, the father of Satanism. And he, he said that that's where he opened his doorway to 
another dimension for aliens. And I mean, this place has had, you know, it's like it checks every box on crazy. And then this girl, and you don't know really what's going on, but she had severe mental problems. And, you know, it's another one of those things. You don't know if she just did that. Was there foul play? You don't know. And it's one of those things where everyone that was involved in it did a piss poor job and was weird. You know, and then you're looking for clues and that leads to another clue and that leads to another clue. And even the, the police that released the video, there's like 15 seconds missing. And they're like, we don't have it. You can't see it. We're like, what the hell happens in the other 15 seconds? You know, and, and it's just a, a crazy, crazy story. <laughs> it, would, it, it would just be another missing person story. Um, the difference here is that we have the video. Uh, I think you know. I mean, I, it, there's some interesting circumstances around the the you know her her body being in the water tank and the wind clothes were, but still that you know they'll explain. Well, it wasn't was, one of the door the door to the tank really that mean she may not. They, they don't think that she would have been strong so, enough to yeah. lift it. Yeah. Uh, and then certainly, uh, how did it get, once she got in, because it wasn't like there was a, a, a ladder down, so how did she close it uh, once she was inside the water tank? Uh, there, there's a lot of weirdness there, but the video is what gets yeah. people fired. It is so bizarre. Like, uh, the video for me, like, she's like looking out. She's, of the, she's, she's like hiding. hiding. Exactly. Like, she's using the elevator to hide, and she keeps peeking out. So look, like, I'm not saying, like to answer your question, I'm not saying it was aliens, but it's aliens. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I think. Yeah, and there, so there, the other thing is there's this famous, I guess, game called the elevator game where you push a series of buttons and it's a it goes back to like the 20s. And like you push a series of buttons and it takes you up to the top level. And supposedly the, the joke is that when you get to the top level, why do you say it like that? Uh, <laughs> When the door opens, it's another, uh, it opens a portal, and if someone comes on, if you speak to them, they kill you. And she's pushing buttons, so people are like, it's obvious she's playing the elevator game, and it got her, and then that was the, uh, a lot of people talked about that, and, and it's just one of those things where when there's a little bit of doubt, everyone just starts throwing darts at a board and seeing what they can hit. And this one just had so many questions that uh, people, people went crazy on. Who else isn't a Clinton that's got a question? <laughs> Anybody? So as long as you guys have been doing... Oh, sir. Uh, what's the documentaries? Yeah. Oh, okay. we? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, so we, we live right by each other. Yeah, we're pretty close to each other. It's a small ass world. Uh, I've done uh, a brush with people one, a brush with people two. Uh, another film called Patience. Uh, another film that's called The Interconnected. Uh, those are the four films that you can find on what's called Vimy Space, uh, which is Nick Rock and which is the Saints and Paranormal Network. Um, so those are the ones that I'm like pushing the most. I've done others, obviously, that uh, aren't as good. <laughs> <laughs> so you better get them well, yeah, and I was with Dave. We did Into the Light. I don't remember that. Mm -hmm. you, yeah, you were there. <laughs> and then uh, I did a really cool one. It's called Yes, No, Goodbye. Uh, you can find it on Amazon Prime now. Uh, yes, no, the Bible is all about Ouija boards and uh, more and things like that. And I, I wanted to get it to, to move like as much as possible. And so we went all over the, the country and did it. So did, did it? it. <laughs> no, 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 no. Did it move? Did it? Did it? Did it all over the country? Yeah, we did it all over the country. No, I didn't ask you. But yeah, we got it. $1.99 on Amazon. No, it's free, no. Just the documentaries. If you live in that part of the world, they didn't talk about it. Okay, just a matter of a second. But Josh also has Malvern Manor. Uh, tell us a little bit about Malvern Manor while you're up there. Just if we do have people. That are uh, yeah, broad strokes on Malvern Manor. It was a hotel initially. It was built in the late 1800s. Uh, in the 1950s, it became what we would consider to be more like a nursing home type setting. And then in the 1970s, it became a group home for mentally handicapped people. Uh, Everything from just people, awesome karma. Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. But I mean, we're talking like people uh, with classic addiction cases, you know, things that we see every day uh, to, you know, multiple personalities or DID, I believe is the PC term to use these days, um, schizophrenia. 
Michigan. Uh, murderers were housed there as well. And this is an odd population of people. So there's places like that that we just won't know. Absolutely, yeah. It's a very common settlement. This is where they house the Central Live and the Asian Italy Baptist Charter. How long have you been with Baptist Charter? What are you doing? Right at uh, three, four years. Like in in Melbourne Bay, it's, it's a fairly active place as far as paranormal things, and you guys actually do, uh, you regularly do uh, investigations there and host people and things like that. Yeah, we have people who are open, you know, for tours uh, throughout the day or whatever. Um, and then, obviously, you can always come and stay the night as well, if you wish. Um, it's on the pillow. Some people do last all night. We've had people last as little as 30 minutes. So it's a pretty amazing place. So, yeah. That's why I bought it. <laughs> I'm picturing <laughs> I'm picturing the uh, the building from uh, American Horror Story Asylum. Similar. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you guys were talking about things that you believed in, whatever. John, you touched on this just a little bit, but for the other three of you guys, what did you think that you would never believe in that throughout your study of these types of things that you now have grown to believe in? You know, you didn't think this was real, but oh my gosh, epiphany. For me, like it's always been um, just the general idea of people being psychic, having psychic abilities. Um, now, obviously, getting into this field more and more, and meeting more people, uh, I've met more than a handful of people that have truly knocked my socks off, uh, telling me things that there is absolutely. I mean, my mom don't know half this crap. Okay, <laughs> like there is. Pretty impressive things out there. So I do believe now that yes, the, the phenomenon does exist. These people do have gifts um, to be able to, you know, see different things, hear different things. It's phenomenal. Jason, uh, mine would be pretty much the same thing, but as an extension as well. That I think that it's possible that anybody can do it. Anybody here to warrant that? Um, as long as you, I mean, I don't know. How I think that it's a phenomenal feat. We're coming full circle. Yeah. Uh, that's what I always say. It's like I'm, a, I'm about as psychic as a blade of grass. Yeah. Okay, like not at all. Uh, yeah. You could be if you want. Well, I could be if I wanted to. Everybody tells me that. Do you not want to? I guess they just don't want to. I'd yeah. rather play with the gadget. Well, there is some thing to say about not wanting to. I've had people tell me that I could be if I wanted to be. Um, I don't know if I would be ready for that. If I to be. So I don't know. I'm generally, I've had one reading from, or maybe two on the show at times. Um, I've generally been skeptical of that, but I don't know. I don't like getting readings, honestly, too much. And I don't, I don't know if I want to go down that road at this time of life. Part of me does, part of me doesn't. Part of me wants to take a bunch of psychedelics and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Big part of it. The Joe Rogan. Which part? Unsettling stuff from you know testing on on people you know the Tuskegee Airmen and St. Louis and and just the evil atrocities that they've done and you you start looking I mean we did cover you know Project Paperclip speaking about Nazis and they they go and they bring in these these um, scientists and everyone's being pulled up in uh, for war crimes but these these scientists you did a good job so we're going to go ahead and get you uh, over here at a nice cushy job and you guys keep doing what you're doing we're going to forget about the horrible things you've done and you just realize if your government's okay with this where do you draw the line let me be clear everything that brent just mentioned i 
I obviously believe it. I, I, it's not that I don't believe that the government's evil or can't be evil or wouldn't be evil. It's that I don't think they have the ability to do it on such a wide spread. Uh, right. <laughs> like, 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 you'll, you'll find out in 35 to 40 years that, that, that that's exactly what's true. <laughs> yeah. they, like, they, they literally, uh, of course they've done all these horrible things. We have proof of a lot of it, but it's it's one-offs, it's smaller things. The the idea of this greater uh, deep state sitting there, you know, kind of pulling the strings. Buzzwords. Uh, yeah, yeah, I just, I, I don't, I have a harder time with that because I just don't believe it's in human nature to stay that quiet and to be that um, uh, organized. Uh, there would just, there, there would be more out there. So that's that's where that's where he and I differ. I, I, we, we both agree that, uh, they're, they're, I mean, look at all the things that have been proven from, um, uh, what, uh, we just did an episode on it, the, uh, the LSD experiments. Oh, yeah, the, you know, 